good morning good day namaskar namaste vanakkam and all of those uh, greetings for people who are tuned in uh, here in the united states uh, some may be hopefully in india and who knows uh, a few people from across the world so i can't simply say good morning it's eight o'clock uh, 8 30 um, eastern standard time uh, here in the united states uh, my name is Ramesh Rao, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this series of talks uh, that the Indic Book Club organizes every week. And so this week, it is a uh, pleasure uh, to be online, to be live, and to uh, talk a little bit about the kind of uh, opportunities that we have in India uh, to know one another better. And it seems kind of strange because if we think about uh, Indian civilization, India as a nation, the culture and so on, we take for granted uh, that somehow there is a commonality that we know each other and that maybe uh, there is not much for either uh, a new field to probe into who we are, whether we know each other, and how we talk to each other. Uh, my background is in communication studies. I have a PhD from Michigan State University and, and uh, having taught nearly 30 years here in the United States, uh, recently, about five years ago, maybe uh, a friend and I, uh, Professor Avinash Thombre from the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, uh, and I decided uh, that we need to explore the possibility of using our expertise in intercultural communication and see India in that kind of a framework. So uh, what is intercultural communication? Uh, it seems yet another newfangled approach to uh, the study of uh, people. Uh, our, our attempt at understanding uh, people through the kind of social studies or social sciences approach um, mixed with with the with the kind of humanities approach and and when we think about it that way really uh, we may feel and and rightly so for those of us who have who have you know gone gray in our hair to say ah what is new in the world anyway? Um, but then I think uh, if we can step back and look at maybe what younger people or maybe what people who may not have read about these matters uh, could prosper from by studying ourselves in this case in such a way that we can throw light upon what are really some challenges. So for example, if, if I can think of Assamese, okay, how much do I, do I know about Assam? How much do I know about the languages? How much do I know about the ordinary day-to-day -day habits of the Assamese? And even when I say the Assamese, I am merely generalizing across a whole region which contains, which is home to a variety of people who speak a variety of languages. Uh, so we end up with stereotypes. Now, uh, you know, stereotyping we think of as, as mostly negative, but it did not be. Just like, for example, here in the United States, uh, we have people stereotyping that Asians, uh, under which uh, we Indians are also included, are good in math and science. Okay. Now, that is a positive stereotype, but it is also what we would call, uh, in terms of stereotyping, kind of limits us. Okay. So if, if, you, were, if you were someone who grew up in uh, Delhi, and, and if you were to think south of the Vindhyas, uh, it's kind of South India uh, or the old 
Oh, Madrasi. Uh, really? Uh, I mean, sure, as, as a quick handle to kind of um, refer to someone uh, who live south of the Vidyas, that is fine. But unfortunately, and to this day, uh, we Indians, and I, I, you know, I'm an Indian American, I came to this country 32 years ago. So I still have my feet, my foot, one foot uh, in the United States, one in India, because I write a lot about India, I study India. Uh, we, we have ignored the possibility of, of educating our children, educating our people about the languages, the cultures, the habits, the mores, the foods, the music, a whole variety of life practices across the subcontinent. You know, we cannot, of course, ignore Pakistan and Bangladesh because after all, you know, they were part of India and, and they were merely kind of, you know, artificially chopped off. But that is India. Uh, and India is uh, the second largest country. And of course, if you include Pakistan and Bangladesh, India would be the largest country in the world. Now, how much really do we know of one another? And do we really care to put some time and effort to understand one another and therefore be able to communicate with one another with a lot more success? with a lot more fluency, with a lot more ease, uh, with a lot more concern, with a lot more understanding? Or do we wish to continue as we have done? You know, not that it is necessarily completely uh, unsuccessful or inefficient, after all, as, as, as I have mentioned, we have lived together for millennia. And, and so somehow, you know, we have lived next to each other uh, in our own enclaves, uh, or as if you want to use a negative term, in our own ghettos or our in, in our own little colonies. And while we have transacted with one another, we have just left the others be, okay? You to yours, me to mine. And that has worked. Surely that has enabled the kind of diversity in India. And in fact, that is, that is the strength of India's because we have let others know you can do whatever you want in your own context, in your own spaces. And I will do, we will do our own in our own spaces. Uh, in fact, that, that is the strength of, of a system of communities uh, that have enabled the kind of diversity in, you know, everything from languages to food habits to music uh, to ways of observing, um, you know, all of these ceremonies from birth to death. Okay. And I think, I think we can take part of that philosophy and now as a nation system, India as a nation, can we, you know, begin to pay a little bit more attention so that, you know, we can continue to say, oh, you to yours, us to ours. But then we have to acknowledge this. <clears throat> as a nation system, we mostly live under one set of laws. <laughs> Even though, of course, we now have uh, this whole debate about a uniform civil code. Uh, and, and there is this whole conflict about, about this matter about you to yours and us to ours, because the nation seeks to bring about a standardization in laws that are applicable to everyone. Okay, so that's a whole different topic by itself. But I think we can, if we pay some attention, and I hope Professor Tombre and I have kind of kick-started this conversation, where we 
spend some time uh, really not not to kind of generalize about one another or not to stereotype about one another and even forget about celebrate one one another or tolerating one another and all of those kinds of things it's just a matter of knowing one another okay and i think that would be the first and maybe even the final step because in life you know after all you know in terms of our indian civilizational values what is the most important it is knowledge it's knowledge of the self and the knowledge of the self can happen when we also pay attention to the knowledge of others and here, I think the modern intercultural communication field it will be a little helpful and a very quick, brief tour through how this particular field has kind of emerged. Back in the 1940s, late 1940s, early 1950s, the United States, uh, in a kind of a brave new world after the Second World War, realized that um, its diplomats needed to engage uh, the world much more closely much more effectively uh, they were establishing embassies uh, all over the world they were they were trying to help europeans recover they were trying to help the japanese recover they were you know uh, there was a whole lot of demand on american diplomats to know a lot more about the people that they were much more closely engaging with with that came you know um, a, a really kind of a serious need and, and therefore, they, they hired uh, Professor Edward Hall, an anthropologist who had studied, you know, his initial work was in studying Native Americans. Uh, and and he, had, he had kind of discovered um, that, you know, <clears throat> there are whole ways of looking at the world uh, based on our own tribal, ethnic, linguistic, uh, regional, kinds of uh, identities and practices and 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 experiences and he had begun to kind of put those uh, you know bits of knowledge that he had gathered uh, working with uh, uh, quote unquote the indian uh, tribes here the native americans and and he became the go to person uh, and he was asked to help he was asked to help train American diplomats. And so the last 66, seven decades now, the field of intercultural communication has kind of grown. And there is a you know, whole bit of work being done by people uh, across the world, but especially in the United States where it has established itself as part of the communication field. Okay. And we look at everything from how people's worldviews are influenced, how uh, language differences can lead to different weather. For example, language differences lead to the ways of perceiving the world. Uh, what are the kinds of nonverbal communication differences? So when we say nonverbal communication, uh, just look at the way I'm dressed today. Okay, I'm sitting here in my uh, Georgia your home. Um, and, and wearing a kurta uh, and you know trying to show a little bit of my Indian identity. But that itself could be uh, a distraction or an attraction based on who the viewer is. Okay. The whole setting behind me, for example, is also part of my nonverbal communication uh, context. But nonverbal communication includes everything from uh, how we greet one another. Uh, so there is a very interesting book titled Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands, or Do Namaste. Okay? <laughs> the book title doesn't include, you know, uh, folding hands in greetings. But those differences, if we don't know about those differences, can lead to misunderstanding, miscommunication. Uh, it could lead to the kinds of conflicts, unnecessary conflicts, because we don't understand one another and uh, our behavior. We, we think some, something that I say in a particular tone or something that I do 
if I stand at a distance instead of closer, uh, somehow the other person thinking that I'm disrespecting him or her, uh, the way I dress, uh, these are all parts of nonverbal communication. And then our culture also makes us uh, kind of um, perceive the world in different ways. So if you can think of worldviews, our, our understanding of the world is shaped by everything from our religious books and texts uh, to our food habits, um, to uh, our understanding of male, female uh, roles in the world. Okay. And therefore, uh, the intercultural communication field has, has kind of, you know, grown with quite a few, um, uh, you know, scholars now working uh, mostly again in the United States, but uh, you can find them you know, in places, um, some places in Europe and and then some in Australia and so on, uh, Australia and New Zealand, and, and maybe also, you know, the Chinese and the Koreans and the Japanese have begun to take uh, note of this field. But we in India have not yet paid attention. Uh, we have kind of subsumed these uh, bits of, uh, inquiries, knowledge pursuits in the tradition field of whatever cultural studies or uh, maybe even in political science or international relations and so on. Uh, but we have not been teaching in Indian universities uh, any courses in what you would call intercultural communication. So Professor Pombre and I decided, hey, you know, we need to kind of say whether this would be a useful way for all of us to help uh, in the pursuit of knowing one another so that we can communicate with each other better and therefore maybe even help in the cause of nation building if you know if you think that would be a good end but that is not again the goal that we have in our book our book is basically about the kinds of ways in which we perceive the world and therefore how we misperceive one another uh, and, and therefore the opportunities that we have to engage uh, in the study of one another so that we can actually begin to uh, understand one another better. Okay, so that is the broad and kind of a, a a general summary of what we have done in uh, some 350, 400 pages of our book, uh, which you can see over my right shoulder. Uh, and, and for those of you who have uh, already thumbed through the book, you may have some uh, specific questions for me or comments. So what I'm going to do now um, is to open this up for comments. So if you can either, um, you know, type in your comment or question, I'll be uh, glad to respond to that. And as I uh, wait for, for questions to uh, pop up on my screen, uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about um, my own growing up in India and, and the kinds of challenges that I had figuring out neighbors, not just across, you know, the region, but even within uh, the state that I grew up in, that I was born in. I was born in uh, Karnataka, uh, actually a small town close to Bangalore. Uh, uh, it is now called Ramanagara. Uh, it used to be called close pet. Uh, and and so mostly I, you know, as a as a young boy, uh, grew up in the south side of Karnataka, uh, what we would call call old Mysore. Uh, but as my father, who was an engineer working for the Karnataka government, uh, was posted across the state. Uh, we, you know, he was based in towns like Darwar or Belgaum or Bidar or Raichur. And, and suddenly, 
my world began to open up because I found that uh, someone in Dharwar uh, did not speak Kannada the same way that I did uh, back in Bangalore. Uh, I could not figure out why they had last names that were initially very funny for me. You know, last names like Mersinikai or Ittagi uh, and and uh, Ullagadde. You know, these are basically names of vegetables and grains and, and you know, Ittagi is a brick. How could someone have last names like that? Now that, now that I look back, no one at that time, not in any textbook that at least I had in my school, discuss these matters to tell children across Karnataka. You know what, children? Karnataka is a land of differences. People speak differently based on whether they are in Mangalore or Bangalore or or or, or Harwar or Raichur, because if we went to Raichur or Bidar, you saw you heard a lot more Urdu being mixed in Kannada. And there was no uh, discussion, uh, no lessons about how we differed in food habits. You know what we ate in. South Mysore, you know, I mean, there might have been a little something about a farmer eating ragi mudde in, you know, in, in Mandya and, and uh, a farmer in, in Dharwar eating uh, Java roti. Okay. But they were, they were very minimal. They were very superficial. So even the, un but then those differences were taken for granted. No one bothered to walk the children through those differences so that we could actually uh, have, have uh, uh, children, uh, you know, uh, know about these kinds of differences and talk about this and understand that, that India was a, was, a, was a land of differences. And that's what made our, you know, choice in music. So, for example, when I, you know, growing up in, you know, the southern parts of Karnataka, um, you know, uh, heard my mother sing, you know, classical, light classical music, Carnatic music, and then go up to the Harvard in, in Belgaum, uh, where my father was posted as the local municipal engineer. I said, ah, there was no real interest in Carnatic music. It was a land of Hindustani music, North Indian classical music. How was that so? There was no discussion. There was no engagement by our school teachers about these differences. They lived it. But then there was nothing in our lessons, in our textbooks, that enabled us to kind of talk about, celebrate, and understand all of these fantastic features just within Karnataka. So if I was so ignorant about Karnataka, how much more ignorant was I about the rest of the country? So when I, when I for the first time, uh, when I was in, I think, ninth grade, traveled by train, uh, to to what was then Bombay, and and uh, at that time we, we didn't have you know the broad gauge railway uh, tracks uh, that ran from you know all the way from Karnataka to Mumbai. Uh, so we ended up you know taking the meter gauge train up to Pune, which was then Pune, and then had to change the train in uh, Pune to go to Mumbai. And we got off the train in Pune. And I remember as a 14-year-old, kind of shocked when I stepped down onto the railway platform, a kind of a sea of red. And I asked my parents, what is happening? And they said, oh, it is, it is just people chewing pan. 
and spitting. Now, that the whole idea of chewing pan was itself a kind of an eye-opening experience for me. The kind of regional habits that we have. Okay. Uh, there was no one, again, okay, my parents knew very little about this. It was, in fact, uh, the first uh, trip for them, too, in terms of visiting Mumbai. So they were maybe as, you know, surprised and as uncomfortable as I was as a 14-year-old traveling just across from one state to another. Okay. So there were language differences. None of you, us knew uh, Marathi. Then luckily, you know, we, you know, I had an uncle in Pune and, and uh, uncle and aunt in, in Mumbai who, who, you know, took care of us and all of those kinds of things. And it's a fascinating visit. But I think about, again, how, if only in our schools, we had a lot more discussion about our own differences in a variety of ways, rather than reading a, a whole bunch of uh, Greek or British or American or whatever world history and, 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 you know, literature and so on. I think English could be taught using uh, the poems written by, you know, poets across India and have us read those poems in translation so that, you know, someone, you know, a student in Uttar Pradesh in uh, Uttarakhand or, or someone in Delhi would be as aware of a Dara Bendre as, as a, a South Indian student, a student from Karnataka being uh, aware of a poem written by Chitre or by, you know, poets across India. Those were, you know, again, the attempts are there, but it is still very minor. And therefore, we continue to stereotype one another. Oh, Sardarjis are like this. Oh, Andhra people are like this. Uh, oh, the, you know, Madrasis are like this. And I think, therefore, uh, we end up basically being ignorant of one another or have only a superficial knowledge about one another. And then when there are conflicts, surely there are conflicts. Just take, for example, something like a language conflict. Uh, we don't know how to deal with this uh, issues. So um, here again, I am waiting for questions from from people across. I don't know if um, you are uh, able to respond. Uh, let me see. Let me minimize the window here and and see if there is anything else going on. Okay, uh, uh, I believe uh, you should all have gotten a summary of well, uh, my, my commentary here. I am still waiting to uh, see if there is uh, anyone interested in engaging on this discussion and, and if indeed you are able to, uh, to access my, my commentary and if you if you would uh, 
kindly type in your question or comment. I would be uh, glad to uh, respond to it. And I will we'll wait a few, you know, maybe a minute. Uh, I don't want to fill it with silence uh, because uh, as a professor of communication and someone who has been on radio and television, uh, I also realized that uh, no one likes uh, silent spaces. Uh, looks like uh, I'm not able to to kind of uh, see the questions, but hopefully now that I have opened up another uh, Facebook window, I can I can look across and see what the questions have been. Huh. And this is the, of course uh, the challenge of uh, technology and sometimes new technology, where uh, if uh, you know doing Facebook Live for the first time. Uh, I may not be looking at the right places. Okay, ah, interesting. Um, a question uh, from Shruti. Uh, how can a Punjabi raised in Tamil Nadu <laughs> make both community communities understand their uniqueness? Ah, and, and this is happening more and more. Uh, it's not just person uh, being raised, you know, you know, if I were born in Karnataka and raised in Delhi or Mumbai, uh, that's one thing. These days we are seeing um, a lot more uh, what we would simply call um, intermarriages in the sense that, um, you know, a Punjabi marrying a, a, a Tel, you know, Telugu uh, girl uh, or, a, or a, a, a boy from Madras marrying someone from uh, Gujarat and so on. And I think the challenge, and you know, and I have Quite a few in my family uh, who who are who have not only wedded people from across the world but from across the country, which was quite rare in my parents' generation, and which was quite rare when I was growing up. You know, so till maybe I was in my twenties, uh, I had not seen uh, this level of intermarriages, and I think that has happened because of the kinds of changes that we have seen in Indian society and across the world. You know, the whole, uh, the world is flat approach, and uh, the globalization approach, uh, the global village approach, and the, and the uh, you know, advance of new technologies and so on, which has made people, you know, uh, Bangalore, for example, has become an attractive hub for people from all over India. Uh, so it's a question of basically, asking one another questions, being interested in one another's backgrounds and life. Uh, I think we should all attempt to speak other languages. And here, you know, I confess uh, I'm not very good. Uh, uh, I lived in uh, Chennai for one year and my Tamil, yeah, I can understand a little bit of Tamil, but my, you know, I have not tried speaking Tamil uh, much. Whereas, for example, my wife, who grew up in Mysore, is as comfortable <coughs> speaking Hindi and Malayalam and Tamil uh, as she is in Canada. And in fact, I tease her that her Malayalam or Tamil is better than her uh, Canada, even though she grew up in a Canada-speaking family. Uh, so uh, I, I think I think uh, we have to both formally have our school system pay attention to you know including material in our in our school textbooks so that children will become a lot more aware of differences and opportunities <coughs> to to learn uh, to know one another but also you know if, i mean now with with new technologies and new opportunities i think instead of us all simply flocking with 
of birds of the same feather uh, to try and look at what else is available and who else we can befriend so that we actually, you know, begin to learn uh, about one another's habits, ways of think thinking and so on. Okay. Uh, a few other questions here. Um, let me take a look at the next one. Ah, the, does our book offer insights on how to understand diverse communication styles? Okay. Um, yes and no. Now, communication style, we focus both on language differences as well as nonverbal differences. Okay. And I think, especially in terms of nonverbal differences, um, of course, you know, we see that, you know, especially through through our movies and so on, uh, we have you know, kind of begin to have a little bit of knowledge of one another, but there's a lot of stereotyping also. So many of the Bollywood movies and, you know, I think back of my own days growing up uh, in, in Karnataka, uh, you know, the Bollywood movies tended to stereotype everyone else except, you know, the kind of unique Bollywood universe, okay? Uh, and, and sometimes you know, the stereotyping was in fun, was in, you know, lighthearted uh, fun. But then they did very little to uh, enable a real understanding of differences. So we had to go to what we would call the regional movies. So to understand something of, uh, Bengal, uh, you know, you had to kind of watch uh, the Satyajit Ray movies or Mrinal Sen movies, uh, you know, or if you, you know, and, and, and if you wanted to know a little bit about more about Tamil Nadu, watch the Tamil movies, but those are difficult. And I think, you know, and this is the reason why Professor Tombre and I said, we can standardize these, we can include these material both in our school textbooks and college courses and our book if you thumb through it you will see chapters on nonverbal communication on differences in worldviews on differences in matters like you know uh, how we look at each other you know in some regions or some states people are much more what we would you know to use uh, a, a, a kind of a broad term, much more feudal in their approach to 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 relationships. Okay, there's a lot of power distance. So the one who has power is a lot more powerful than the one who does not have power, and therefore there is a lot more distance between the two, and therefore a lot of oppression, a lot of discrimination. Okay, and then in some of the places there is less so. And we walk readers through all of those kinds of tools necessary to understand why people behave in one way or another. Okay. Um, another question. When we talk of India and its history to people who don't have much uh, of an idea, um, where should we begin? Uh, how should we narrate our story? Uh, and do we include the greater Indic civilization of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on? And uh, and in fact, uh, Mahalakshmi's question refers to our, you know, the first two chapters in our book, where we trace uh, Indian civilization. Uh, at least, you know, we are not historians, uh, both uh, Professor Thombre and I. Uh, we have a smattering of knowledge based on our own reading of a variety of books. And, and of course, I have a little bit more understanding as a member of a variety of discuss discussion groups where, you know, I've had the opportunity of engaging with people who are indeed uh, historians or linguists, um, 
experts in cultural studies and so on. And, and yes, we need to begin at the beginning, uh, however far it goes, so that we understand the nature of Indian cultural habits, performances, traits, and beliefs. And without that, what will happen is that we become a kind of deracinated, rootless, modern people who think we are good because we are modern. We think we are good because we can quickly embrace what we think of as modern or progressive. But then we find out that if we are not rooted, we are also not a very happy people. So as individuals, if I distance myself away from my cultural upbringing, traditions, knowledge systems, and so on, I might be able to, for example, sit down with my white American friend and exchange a few things and, and drink, um, you know, uh, and eat in a way that may make the other person think, oh, yeah, you know, Brahmesh uh, can actually hold his own in whatever kind of situation. But that is not it. But I, if my friend also begins to understand when he asks, questions about my background, how knowledgeable I am, and how I can explain to him or her about my roots. They are so much more fascinated about who I am. I am not simply a carpetbagger who knows or cares, cares little about anything, and am here just to make a living. So it is important, uh, Mahalakshmi, that I think we have to understand our roots to be able to understand others. Okay, um, another question uh, is, is uh, globalization uh, homogenizing uh, language, code, symbols, and cultures um, you know, uh, and and uh, how do we communicate as ourselves, living in a different culture, uh, different place? <laughs> uh, this is a challenge. Uh, I think we are living through times of quick changes, major changes. Uh, therefore, it is both a time of opportunity and danger. Uh, it's both a time of difficulty and ease. Now, opportunity for opportunities for those people, you know, I know so many of my young nephews and nieces and cousins who are traveling all over the world with their base in India, in Bengaluru or in Chennai, and who are much more traveled than I am. Okay. Uh, and, and in a way, uh, they are part of the global village. They are global citizens. They seem to be as much at ease doing business in Hong Kong for a couple of weeks and coming back, traveling business class, and having a particular ease and comfort dealing with the world. But what about my other young nephews, nieces, and cousins who have grown up in small town Karnataka who are still doing the kinds of jobs that don't provide the opportunity of, you know, of such travel. They don't have the kind of, uh, you know, disposable income where they can even travel across India. For them, just like Americans who similarly don't have opportunities, the world becomes that much more of a difficult place to comprehend and a difficult place to live. 
they may enjoy access to their cell phones, but they are not at ease letting go of their rootedness, of their, of their languages, of their ways of doing things, of their value systems. And when we say value systems, who do you marry? What do you eat? What do you drink? What do you not drink? Can you have boyfriends or girlfriends? What is the nature of, you know, how many times do you go to a temple? What do you celebrate? What do you observe? What do you not observe? And we see this happening in India. You know, uh, suddenly there is, not suddenly, there's a lot of pushback, especially against Hindu ways of doing things from those who think of themselves as modern or progressive, okay? You know, here we see a real class clash of civilizations or cultures within our own cultures. So it is not a clash of civilization between a Muslim and a Hindu or a Hindu and a Christian or a Christian and a Muslim or an, a Japanese and an, and, an, and an American, but of among our own, between those who consider themselves modern and progressive and secular or whatever, to those who come to consider themselves as, you know, not necessarily traditional, but as a Hindu or as, you know, whatever, you know, their label is for their own understanding of themselves. So, yes, how, you know, and, and this is, this is uh, a tricky place to be in. And I think there is an attempt at, you know, maybe making us all modern and progressive. There's a whole kind of liberal worldview. But then there is also pushback. And, you know, and again, that is, uh, you know, uh, for another conversation, hopefully in the next uh, coming weeks on uh, the Indic book chat so that we can talk a little bit more about this. Okay. Uh, then, uh, oh, my goodness. Um, uh, there is a question here about um, uh, music traditions that have been able to withstand, um, you know, challenges from other traditions. But slowly we are seeing a trend in terms of fusion music. Will Indian traditional music uh, go through changes? Uh, and then we have, you know, a lot of churning, especially, I think, in, in, in traditional um, uh, music uh, fields. So, for example, in Carnatic music, uh, you know, there are people who are otherwise well trained, you know, talented, who are challenging the system from within. Uh, and, and for reasons they, you know, that 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 sometimes are kind of idiosyncratic, or again, in the in the in the name, um, or under the label of progressive, secular um, uh, kind of uh, goals. Um, uh, I think, I think, uh, you know, whatever is strong will continue. Uh, there will be changes, you know, uh, after all, uh, change is uh, that which we can, uh, you know, expect in everything uh, about human life. Um, so uh, with that, uh, maybe very quick and, and you know, and, and, and not a, a, a complete uh, answer. I think it's almost time for me to wind up. Uh, I hope uh, this particular chat has been kind of useful and it kind of, as I said, kickstart some conversations across, you know, groups uh, across uh, uh, India. And, and I thank once again, um, uh, the wonderful organizers of the Indic Book Chat. Um, and, and I hope you will tune in next week uh, for another session um, here uh, in terms of our live chats. Okay. It's been a, my pleasure and privilege uh, to be here this, uh, this Sunday. Uh, and I hope, uh, uh, you know, uh, people will, will access this as and when uh, they see the need. Uh, thank you uh, and, and goodbye.